So you could do this with this, or you could also do this with a Grignard or an alkyl lithium. We talked in the past about how Grignards and alkyl lithiums could act like either bases or nucleophiles. Remember we said this is why you have to keep these away from protic solvents. You have to keep these away from protic solvents because they would otherwise act like a base and take away the proton from the proton solvent, from the protic solvent. Well, these could also take away the proton from an alkyne because we've seen that the proton for the alkyne is not attached very, very firmly. This proton is not very firmly attached because the carbon doesn't mind having a negative charge. So any of these might be used as the base that gives us the alkyne nucleophile. And then we could use the alkyne as a nucleophile to attack other things. So far, so good? Let's try to go through the mechanism and predict the product from this reaction. One thing that's always a good idea when there might be any confusion about the product is to number the carbons. Well, the first step here is to notice the reactive atom. It should be clear that this nitrogen is the reactive atom in the first step. We should recognize this as a classic ionic bond, because this is bonded to sodium, so we need to put in these charges, a plus charge here and a negative charge here, because it's ionic. And then this, uh, this um, amide over here is going to be able to act like a nucleophile or a base. Well, in this case, we expect it to act like a base, because we know we have a relatively good acid around, which is this alkyne. Again, in the past, we've never seen carbons really just losing hydrogens out of the blue, except maybe in an E2 or an E1 reaction, but an alkyne can do that. This is just the solvent. The liquid ammonia here is just the solvent. This is the active ingredient here, the base. So here the nitrogen has taken the base. If you want to, you can show the spectator ion has moved over to the alkyne anion now. That's probably not too crucial. All right, and now it should make sense that this should be now a nucleophile. That was the whole purpose of this reaction, to give us a carbon nucleophile. And who does it make sense to put at the head, this number six carbon? Why is it reasonable for this carbon to be at the tail as a nucleophile? Because now it has a negative charge. And why is it reasonable for this number six carbon to be an electrophile? It's delta positive. In fact, what's the name of the reaction we're doing here? 
SN2. It's just a normal SN2. We never used this nucleophile for SN2 before because we hadn't learned about alkynes yet. But now we know that deprotonated alkynes can be used as SN2 nucleophiles. And that's the lesson here. A deprotonated alkyne can be used as an SN2 nucleophile. It's a good enough nucleophile to do SN2. Now you just want to be very careful when you draw the product that you don't add or lose carbons. So I would do this step by step. I would start with the number one carbon. Who's the number one attached to? Two. two. And who's the number two attached to? Three. Three. Or for us. And I mentioned before that it's probably a good idea to actually draw in the alkyne carbons. And then who's the number three attached to? To the four. Whoops. Who's the four attached to? Six. And who's the six attached to? This is the safest way to draw a complicated product without losing or adding any carbons accidentally. If you don't put in the numbers, it's very easy to add or drop carbons. This is a good way to do this. For example, well, I don't know, some people might have thought there were three carbons here instead of just two. So it's important to be careful about that. That gives us our product. Oh, so I guess uh, the way I had this written before was wrong, right? This is supposed to be linear. This is supposed to be linear, so I have to draw these single bonds in a straight line with this triple bond over here. You have to have a linear arrangement around the triple bond. So this should be uh, linear, and this should be linear over here as well. And that gives us this product. If you want to keep keeping track of the spectator ion, now the spectator, spectator ion would have moved over to keep the bromide happy. That's probably not too crucial. Okay, so what we learned a few minutes ago was that you can deprotonate an alkyne with a strong base, although we would not expect this reaction to work with an alkene or an alkane. And why would you want to do that? To give yourself a good nucleophile that can do, for example, an SN2 reaction. Now we have another tool for lengthening carbon chains. For example, if you're doing a synthesis problem and you see that the product has a triple bond and it has more carbons than you started with, then there's a very good chance that you use this reaction. If the product has a triple bond and more carbons than we started with, Maybe we deprotonated the alkyne and then went through this reaction. But it wouldn't work with an alkene. It wouldn't work with an alkene because remember that it's only the fact that this is sp hybridized that makes it electronegative enough to stabilize this negative charge. So it wouldn't work with an alkene or an alkane. That's why this is the first time we've learned about this type of reaction. Now that we're going over alkynes. So if you have an alkene or an alkane in the product, you would do. Then you might have used Grignard's, or maybe they did it this way and then they turned the triple bond into a double bond. Oh, right. That's right. In a second, we're going to see there's ways to turn triple bonds into double bonds. And double bonds into triple bonds? That's right. We can go back and forth. Who else could this alkyne attack, maybe, besides this halogen? Well, let's actually look at another reaction here. Is this so far so good? Yeah. All right. this reaction. 